today what I'm going to be talking about is um, regulatory T cells. I'm going to get through Carla's slide. OK. And actually, David Rawlings and I are going to kind of um, share this discussion because we now have a wonderful collaborative uh, project supported by the Helmsley Foundation to try to develop a new form of therapy in type 1 diabetes, which is uh, T-regulatory cell-based therapy. And, and he's going to talk about the really exciting new stuff, which is gene editing. So I thought I'd give you some background about what regulatory T cells do, um, how we've been exploring those. And actually, I've been involved in exploring these for more than 10 years. When I went back to my slides, I realized I was pulling them from before 2005. Um, and the other thing I thought was interesting about this story is the study of regulatory T cells is really a story that came out of Seattle, or much of the work came out of Seattle. Of course, there is work done across the world in this, but we had some of the major findings I'm going to be talking about from the University of Washington, at Benaroya Research Institute, and um, Seattle Children's uh, have really been fundamental in moving this field forward. So I'm going to give you a little background, talk about what's being done today in terms of using these cells uh, as a therapeutic, and then I'm going to hand you off to uh, David to talk about what we're doing now uh, with a new approach to this problem. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. And you already had a very nice description of how the immune system works from OK here. And um, I always like to make this point because what I have here is a normal islet. This is a real one um, <laughs> that Carla had a nice uh, example cartoon of. And this is in diabetes. And, and the point here is that all of these black dots are cells. They're those bad guys that Oka was showing you. They're attacking and killing beta cells. And this is what we call autoimmune attack. And in diabetes, it's specific to your islets. So to back up and say, what is autoimmunity? And I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but I think it's nice to build a foundation as we talk about getting into therapies. And the first thing we have to know is the immune system is really required for us to survive. And its job is to detect danger and to destroy those dangerous things. What are they? They're infections, they're viruses, they're bacteria, and they're even cancers. Uh, and as we understand more about the immune response, we've actually developed new therapies in cancer that have been uh, fundamental uh, changes in the way we treat them. So the problem here is that the immune system is meant to protect us. But it's a really powerful instrument, and it can actually lead to tissue destruction when things go awry. So what happens when your immune system fails? And I think if we think about the whole context of our immune response, I can think of it as kind of a start and stop. Um, when you don't have a starter, you have immunodeficiency. It means your immune system doesn't recognize something that's dangerous, or it doesn't have the tools to destroy them. These are people frequently born with genetic uh, defects that lead to an inability of their immune system to work. They get um, infections, frequently die early in life. Of course, we also can create immunodeficiency. And in fact, we're really good at it. We can get rid of your entire immune system if we give you chemotherapy. We can get rid of parts of it with some of the therapies I use in my clinic every day. Um, and so not having a functioning immune system can be, obviously, a serious problem. Now, another place where the immune system uh, messes up is in the setting of allergy. And of course, parents know a lot about peanut allergies and other food allergies. Some of us live with pollen allergies. And this is where the immune system kind of puts on the gas at the wrong time. Your immune system's fine, but then all of a sudden it gets this signal. It sees pollen, and it goes crazy. And so this is a poorly controlled immune response. And then autoimmunity is what we're going to be talking about today. And that's when your brakes fail. So I'm going to be talking today about what are the brakes in our immune system in terms, and, and the thing we're going to focus on is regulatory T cells. <laughs> Sorry, we're distracted. Thankfully, it's not my phone. <laughs> so in type 1 diabetes, your immune system is out of balance. So in autoimmunity, what the immune system has done is it's detected danger in a normal organ. And this is the beta cell, as Oka had pointed out. And it results in injury in that organ. So what we have is we've 
got destruction uh, ruling out over protection. So the real question here is, why is that happening in people with type 1 diabetes? Um, and so we've talked a lot about some of the genetics that put us at risk. And, and I love this description of uh, Scandinavians. I'm a Minnesotan. I'm of Norwegian extraction, so I'm very linked up with the interesting things about those of us from Scandinavia being resistant to certain infections, but then being put at risk for autoimmunity. So there's a lot about genetics, and we've talked about that a bit, but I want to talk about how we figured out that the brakes weren't working in autoimmune diseases. And it started with this mouse. And... Um, it's called the scurfy mouse, and they wouldn't show, let me show you a real picture of a scurfy mouse. But what happens with these mice is they arose kind of on their own in a laboratory. They weren't actually genetically engineered. And they discovered this mouse that didn't grow well. It had horrible eczema, and it had diabetes. And this mouse, my colleague Steve Ziegler told me, was the absolute answer to autoimmunity. And he told this to me in, the, in probably 2002, and I said, I think you're crazy. But what it actually showed in this mouse is it has a mutation that results in autoimmunity. And that mutation is in a gene called FOXP3. And David's going to talk more about FOXP3 with you today because it's become the center of this story about why the brakes go off. Well, at the same time, scientists were trying to understand what was wrong with the scurfy mouse. Um, there's a group of children who were showing up in hospitals, and uh, in fact, at Seattle Children's, where the really seminal work was done. And these kids are a group of kids with a disease called IPEX. So that's immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, X-linked. And that's part of the quiz when you leave with Carlos. <laughs> that's teplizumab. That was your first question. And this is your next question. So of course, the scientist or physician obviously made up this name. These kids come in. They're born frequently already quite ill. They have horrible eczema. They have inflammatory bowel disease. They have diabetes either at birth or very soon thereafter. So gosh, they looked a lot like the scurfy mouse. And in fact, they, when they did genetic studies of these children and their families, they found that they had a mutation in a gene called FOXP3. So maybe Steve was right. <laughs> All right. So what does FOXP3 do? And, and so what this turned out is that we were able to figure out something about a set of cells we hadn't understood before. So we we're talking about these T effector cells. Those are the bad guys attacking the pancreas. Those are the good guys protecting us from infection. But there's also this cell called a regulatory T cell. And its job is to keep these guys in line so that they don't do things like attacking your pancreas. FOXP3 is the master regulator of these cells. So if you, don't have, if you have FOXP3, you are a regulatory T cell. We could get into the weeds on that one a little bit. I've spent at least 10 years trying to figure out this, the real details. But importantly, if you express this, this is a protein, you have a cell that regulates. And it protects you from attacking your own tissue. If you don't have FOXP3, you don't have Tregs, and everything gets out of balance. And you get destruction of tissues. Your body doesn't know when to stop destroying uh, when it detects danger. So of course, this can affect your pancreas. It can, of course, affect other organs, as we see with those kids with IPEX. So one of the questions we spent a lot of time over the years is saying, so in this extreme case, if you don't have FOXP3, you get diabetes. So are Tregs really important in type 1 diabetes? Because I think we always have to go back and say, well, you know, the people who develop type 1 diabetes when they're 14 don't look like the scurfy mouse or the IPEX kids. They've been healthy for a long time. So that's a question we've asked. And um, the question and the way we've asked this question is to say, are there too few Tregs in people with type 1 diabetes so that that destructive process wins out? Are the Tregs just not working very well? So maybe it's a little more subtle than not having FOXP3. Maybe they just don't work right. Or maybe these cells that are causing destruction are particularly nasty cells and um, are resistant to the effects of the Tregs. 
And to sum this up, people have spent a lot of time looking at this, and I think there's two answers here. We actually know that the number of Tregs, at least in the blood of people with diabetes, is actually fine. But we think the Tregs don't work well, we don't think they grow well, and we actually think there's this thing called IL-2, it's a Treg growth factor, that isn't actually doing its job in type 1 diabetes. And I'm going to get back to that because it's a really interesting part of the puzzle here. And then we've also shown that these cells, the cells that are attacking the beta cells, they're particularly tough and they don't listen very well when the Tregs start talking to them. So it means we have several targets we need to go after here if we're going to effectively impact type 1 diabetes. So can we increase Tregs and cure diabetes? Seemed like a straightforward question, and the answer is yes. In a mouse, we can definitely do that. Um, and, and of course, we have to start somewhere, and we know that if you give Tregs to the scurfy mouse, we cure their disease. We know, actually, if you give Tregs to the NOD mouse, and for those of you who've talked to diabetes scientists for years, this is a model that we think is very useful for studying type 1 diabetes. It's a spontaneous model. And we can prevent and cure diabetes in that mouse with Treg. And in fact, we can also do something using this Treg growth factor called IL-2. We can give it to a mouse, an NOD mouse, and we can prevent disease in that mouse. So it does appear that Tregs are important in our models and that we could use them therapeutically. So can this work in people? And I think the answer here is that we're starting to ask that question and we have hints about this. Um, and so one of the things I've been talking about here is this IL-2, this growth factor that helps Tregs grow better. It actually helps them express more FOXP3, that important protein, and they work better when they see it. Um, and in fact, there have been clinical trials in autoimmune diseases using IL-2. And this is uh, data from one of those studies. This is showing the Tregs. There are these black things here. And that's at the baseline. That's when the person started the study. This is a week after they got given IL-2, and then two weeks. So they've been getting this IL-2. So we know we can increase their Tregs. So that's pretty exciting. This has been done in several diseases with good effect. I'm going to show you the one that's easiest for us to all understand. This is the results of a study in a disease called alopecia areata, where you lose all of your hair. And this is an autoimmune disease. Same story. The immune cells are attacking your hair follicles, so you have no hair. And on IL-2, this woman had her hair grow back. So we can see that, in fact, this was an effective therapy. It's been used in several other diseases, most recently in systemic lupus, there was a positive trial. So what about type 1 diabetes? And in type 1 diabetes, this is being actively studied. Dr. Greenbaum um, uh, was one of the first to use this drug in a clinical trial. And several things are important that are um, making us think more about this therapy. The first is, as I showed you in the previous slide, when you give someone with diabetes, diabetes IL-2, they have more Tregs, so that's great. But they also have more other cells. And what this picture is showing, the entire context of the immune response, and I'm afraid IL-2 doesn't only do one thing to our immune system. And so when we give it, we aren't only increasing Tregs. And so we've discovered that that's a bit of a potential problem. But IL-2 therapy is still really exciting. It's been working in other autoimmune diseases. There are many trials right now trying to find the right dose. Can we hit the right dose that makes these guys go up and doesn't really have much influence here? And there are companies who are trying to, and scientists, trying to make a better IL-2 that is more specific for Treg. So this is an exciting area. It's an ongoing area in terms of Treg therapy. So could we give Tregs to people? Not you know, give them IL-2, but give them Tregs. And there are several, several challenges. So one of the challenges is Tregs represent 4% of your T cells, so very rare in your blood. And so if you're going to give people Tregs, you've got to isolate those from the blood. And then you have to grow them in a laboratory. And I showed you sometimes you don't get only Tregs, so it's a little issue. 
and then you can give them to the patient. And this is something that is being done, and I think it's important to know that trials are ongoing and, and they actually have been completed. What do we know in type 1 diabetes? We know it's safe to give these regulatory T cells, um, and we're still looking to see if we can show that it's efficacious and that it protects your pancreas. The first step always is to look for safety, but I'm going to talk about one aspect of this, and that is that I'm getting T regs out, and the T regs job is protect you from all autoimmunity. Well, so which one of these in here is actually going to protect your beta cell? It's going to be actually quite rare. So I'm going to give you a lot of Tregs and hope that some of them protect you from diabetes. So could we do better than that? And I guess that's our job as scientists to go to the lab, um, think, could we do better? And so we know that our immune system is important for infection and tumors, but we want to stop this uh, attack on self, but we want to only protect us from that bad stuff. Um, and in this case, in diabetes, it's um, attacking your beta cells. So if we think about what Tregs do, they protect you from inflammatory bowel disease, arthritis, MS, but let's say, and I didn't have a good pancreas slide, otherwise I, I got to get that from Carla. Um, but what we really want to do, let's say, is pick one of those organs so that the Tregs only are protecting you there because we want, actually, the rest of your immune response to work fine. So how do we do that? So I said that these T cells that recognize your beta cells are rare. They are so rare that there's only one or two of them in a stadium full of Seahawks fans, or at least if you consider the Seahawks fan as the example. So we got to find this guy over here out of all of these individual cells who are in your blood. That has been a problem and a dilemma we've faced for quite a few years. Uh, my colleague at BRI, Bill Kwok, and, and other colleagues, Eddie James, have been really focused like a laser beam on this question and have made amazing uh, progress, which allows me to talk about using islet-specific Treg therapy with you today. So could I get those Tregs that actually are going to protect your pancreas and give them back to you? And everything else stays the same. So I want to talk about a few approaches because David's going to talk about the specific approach that we're do working with him on. But there are other approaches. So one of them is to take Tregs and take the receptor on a T cell that we know recognizes a beta cell and just engineer it onto the surface of that Treg. And people are trying to do that now. If you've heard of CAR therapy in uh, cancer, um, which is being pioneered here at Fred Hutch and in the company Juno, um, we, uh, that's a possibility. Hasn't been done yet. The other possibility is I go in to the stadium and I find that one T reg, I pull it out of your blood, and then I expand it so that I can give you antigen specific T regs. And I'm going to tell you, I've spent 10 years trying to do that, and it's a challenging problem. Um, but then David's group had a really bright idea. And what they've done, oh, they, this one is we start with an effector T cell that is a bad guy. And we use gene editing, which he's going to talk about, and we change it into a good guy. And because of the work my colleagues at BRI have done, I can get him those cells that recognize your pancreas and are bad guys. I can actually find those. And we can now change those into Tregs. So that's the goal of our step in like, how do we get the best therapy in diabetes? And I'm just going to show you a little example of what we're doing to do that. And it's something um, called Tetramer technology. And I really do think it's like finding a needle in a haystack or Waldo in, uh, in Safeco Field. And what these do is they're, special, they're specially designed proteins made in the laboratory that will only find the T cells, in this case, that see beta cells. And what we can do then is take that drop of blood, and we can get the cells that are going to um, identify beta cells. We have the ability now to expand those cells, and people are doing clinical trials with this type of cell. And we believe we're going to be able to change those cells and make them therapeutic instead of pathogenic. 
So I'm going to end there because I'm going to let David talk about the really cool stuff that we're doing with gene editing, but I'm happy to take a few questions if that's yeah, helpful. I think what we'll do, Dr. Buckner, is just let uh, David go yeah, now, and then terrific. we'll invite you back up to the stage, and then we'll have uh, questions uh, at the same time. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Buckner.